English version. So I'm going to start it and start special audio recording. Yeah, this time I'm going to tell you a little bit about my trip around South America. As um, Jens just said, you can either ship your bike or you can decide to buy a bike in a country. I decided to buy a bike in Chile because I just spent 2,500 euro for the whole trip. Usually you spend even more just to ship your bike. How long was the trip? I was on the road since uh, about nine months and I'm back since two months. 2,500 for nine months? Yes. Including, including buying the bike, including petrol, including spare tires, including everything. <laughs> and the flight? That's no, the flight is an extra 1,000 euros. <laughs> yeah, so I went to Santiago de Chile and um, tried to get a bike. But the problem was I didn't get the route and you need a route like a tax number to register a bike as a foreigner and people before me um, they said it was very easy for them to get but when I went to the office they said I need a visa and as a European passport holder I just got the entrance stamp and I didn't have a visa so plan B was to register the bike on someone else's name. It worked fine, um, I got the bike put all my, my luggage on, it was a little Honda 125 CG, it was a bike which is well known to be very trustful, I paid about 800 euro for it and people in, in, in most of the countries of South America ride these bikes, so it's a local bike, everybody has it, you don't look like a fancy tourist. I had to spend one month in Chile until all the registration was done and all the papers were ready so I decided to go south first and just visited some nice places like this place where they were selling horses also some nice beaches and it was winter time in Germany and I sent those pictures home and said I just I was just spending some time at the beach and stuff people were getting very jealous in Germany it was weather like like this when I was having a great time in South America. Warm enough. Well, this animal probably didn't have a great time. It was the, the son of, of this owner. He just finished university and it was a big celebration going on. And I actually wanted to ask him whether I'm allowed to pitch my tent on his property. Um, and then he just invited me and I was part of the family suddenly. And yeah, we were all celebrating that his son finished university and it was the dad of the pig, yes. <laughs> Further south I went to see the um, close to Los Angeles, those waterfalls. It was a nice place to get a shower because when you do wild camping a lot you always look for places to take a shower, <laughs> like this. <laughs> Next picture is loading. I also by chance found there is a school where they care for handicapped um, children people from Germany came to do a social year and I, I have the address if anybody knows someone who wants to spend a year in a country where he can learn Spanish. It was really cool and I also spent one or two weeks um, setting up a Wi-Fi for them and just being, being part of, of this family and of this organization. It's just cool when you travel alone you're never alone. You always get invited and you get in contact and it's always hard to leave again afterwards. <laughs> Here another situation. You come to a farm, you ask, can you pitch your tent because they have fences all around. And they, it's, it's, it's no problem. They say yes and, and put your tent there and then you, you try to go to sleep and then you see they make a fire and someone knocks at your den, tent here, come, come here. And I don't speak any Spanish, so but with hands and feet, if they say like this, it's probably they want me to go there. And they just made a big fire and and suddenly it was kind of a party that some some neighbors came with the big cars and they had a, the music box on the back and suddenly there were people dancing and you could forget sleeping there but it was great and then you, you, you suddenly on the party dancing you don't i don't know what's the reason for this party but it was great i think you are was maybe maybe yes yeah. yeah. so the woman had good fun huh? <laughs> And very close to this place, close to Pucón, there was this volcano. And I tried to go with the bike as close, as far or as close as possible. So there was a little dirt track going up and um, I just decided to pitch my tent there during the night. There was nobody and in the morning I woke up and I hear the, the, the to um, some people walking past my tent talking English and German. So it must have been tourists. I just opened the zipper of my tent and like... Oh. 
what's that? Look out, and, and there are all these people walk past my tent with with the sticks and the helmet and and the, the proper boots and stuff. And I just took my water bottle, my camera, left everything, and just followed them. <laughs> it was a it was an amazing experience to see the the crater on top of the volcano. It was like like really breath breathtaking. It, it was amazing. Yes, and. The group, I mean, the, the, the guy who, who organized the whole thing wasn't very happy about me following him, but... Further south, there was a second Vulcan, and after the first one was so great, I tried to go up this as well, but that wasn't a good idea. There was no to, to, no people to follow, and the, the ice slowly got steeper and steeper, and it's like with the frog in the water. It gets slowly, slowly. It gets hotter, and until he realizes he's already dead. And it's also it gets steeper, steeper. But you don't realize. You always think, ah, it's it's just more, a little, a few meters more. And then during at the noon, the sunbreak came through through the clouds, and suddenly everything um, started to get slippy and, and cold. And so um, I decided not to go further up, and but try to survive and to go down again. And on the way down, I um, realized there are people. Other people like walking with ropes and, and trying, and I was just with my with my with my flip flops like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Somehow I survived, but it, it it was really like I had to hold on with my bare feet, no gloves, nothing to the eyes, and I could warm myself up in the, those hot hot springs. That's the the cheap version, and here you can spend the night in a fancy hotel for a hundred dollars or something. It's great, they have great touristic places in Chile and also the people were very friendly and when I asked to pitch my tent in someone's garden or sometimes I just pitched beside the road, it was fine, nobody stole anything or something, yeah? Uh, where was it, the spring uh, hot Um It is close to Pucón, there is a Villa Rica and Pucón and the little lake and it's around this lake basically. And by chance I got in contact with a local family and they invited me to, to their house and we got on quite well and from, from one day there was a week and then there was two weeks and suddenly I spent Christmas with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Christmas, they had these, this blinking tree, Christmas tree and a great meal and with them they teach me, they try to teach me to, um, German and uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. So um, it it was it was interesting, and I tried to teach them German. So yeah, I started to to get in contact with with the people even better, knowing the language. Um, further, I later on I went back to um, back north towards Santiago, and from Santiago I went to the the coast to um, spend um, New Year there, and it was the biggest party I ever been. So. Yeah, millions of people dancing on the road, everybody has these little f um, funny heads and stuff. It was amazing. And it, was, it wasn't a problem for anybody just to, to take me somewhere and then they introduced me to some friends and stuff. And I don't know, I never had this experience in Germany that, that some people take a foreigner and, and, and just show them around. Amazing. Finally, those papers for my bike were ready and I was allowed to leave the country. So I said goodbye to the people I stayed with here. I had my tent pitched up in the back of the, the <laughs> and yeah, but it was time to leave because I knew um, 1st of January or 2nd of January the Rally Dakar will cross um, along, will go through Argentina and I wanted to take some photos. So I went to from, Ch from Santiago to um, Mendoza to Argentina and it was great, it worked great. I had the power of authority document from the official owner of, of my bike. And yeah, the paperwork wasn't a big problem with a European passport. You just come there, you say hello, you get the stamp and you're in the country. It's not like in Africa, you don't have to apply for visa in advance or something. So I was looking for the place where the ready the car will go um, through and yeah, just went along the same road for a little bit until um, finally I find an old, a nice place to, to wait and yeah, get ready to take some pictures. On the next day, during at noon or something, the first bikes passed and then cars followed. It's, it's amazing. Oh, I mean, on the photo, you don't see how fast they are. 
But when you see them live, you, you don't understand why they just don't explode or something. <laughs> all kinds of cars and, and also quads and stuff just rush through also some some trucks. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I studied machine engineering, but I can't understand why they don't break. <laughs> My bike had a few um, punctures, um, but yeah, I could repair them. I carried a little bit of, of, of tools and stuff, so no problem. Later on, I used couch surfing to get in contact with some people in Argentina, and they invited me to their house with a swimming pool and stuff, which is amazing. And it turned out they, they had horses, they owned some horses, and I never been sitting on a horse before, but of course they asked me, do I want it? Of course I want it, and I got some horse riding lessons. Of course they have Monopoly there as well, and out of one night, it's, it became like two weeks or something. And now they're going to come to Germany and they're going to visit me. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I went further north, going towards um, Bolivia. And it, it, the road went up, up, up higher and higher. There were no trees anymore, but these big cactus. Never saw big cactus like this. And I was lucky some of them just were flowering. So this is very rare. Someone let, later on told me this is very rare. Yeah, then I entered Bolivia and it took a long time to do the border crossing oh, great. because the guy who was in charge of, of giving me the stamp for my vehicle, he was just drinking his mate tea but, but didn't do his job and I, got in, I started to talk with someone else, he also wanted to enter his vehicle and it turned out he, he had a house, a house in La Paz and he invited me, when I ever go to La Paz I'm welcome, just drop an email and visit me. So this for later. Yeah, that's the road going up, 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 up. Beautiful. Yes, beautiful. Some animals just beside the road. And then I went towards the Sala de Uyuni, the big salt lake. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you have salt, salt, salt. You, you have to wear sunglasses and put on some sun lotion because the sun is very strong. You feel you get sunburned so quickly. And yes, they also had, there are some places like, like little rivers or something, people keep them um, wet so they can easily take out some salt. They don't have to do a lot of work, they can just take out the salt to sell it and stuff, to transport it somewhere. They also have salt hotels around um, or close to um, Uyuni, but these hotels are all closed because the government closed them, they didn't have... Um, things for, for their waste and the toilets and everything and so they had to close and so along the, the salt lake there are many empty houses and with a little nail you're able to open the door and you <laughs> own a little house and there were some backpackers many people travel Bolivia with a backpack and of course they also look for a place to sleep and when I had a house of course I invite them into my house <laughs> <laughs> That's a supermarket, you can get everything you really need and it's not so hard to make a choice what to buy there, here it's much harder. A place where you can get fresh orange juice just for a few cents. The funny thing is in Bolivia some traditional women they always wear this head and they usually don't want to be on the photo so you have to zoom as far as you can. La Paz, finally. The capital city. Uh -uh. Many wild dogs live there, and sometimes when you pass with your bike, you hear wow, 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 and then someone tries to snap on your leg. So, didn't really like it, but I was looking for the house of this guy who invited me. <laughs> I had sent him an email, and he gave me the GPS position, so it wasn't a big problem. It also wasn't a house like this, but it looked like this. Wow. <laughs> 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 I, uh, very good, very good. Yeah. Of course, you know, oh, or you can think it wasn't for a night, it wasn't for a week, it was for two weeks. Wow. <laughs> and of course, I could leave all my luggage there and stuff and go around to explore the, the, the landscape, explore the area. And this is the so-called most dangerous road of the world. So the Camina de la Muerte. I want to go there. It's cool. In the old days it was very dangerous because when there are two trucks coming towards each other, they try to squeeze past 
and sometimes if the drivers were drunk or something, they some they slip down or something. In these days, it's just tourists using this road, so it's not dangerous anymore. I had much worse roads, but it's cool to be there and it's amazing to ride along. And it just goes down, down, down. I mean, great. Yes. Yes, people in Bolivia, they build their houses by themselves. So they just take a little bit of mud and they have this wooden thing and they put in some, some mud and go with the feet and they produce their own stones to make their house. It's, it's really cool. And when they don't need the house anymore, they just leave it and there's no waste or anything. It just disappears. <laughs> so we can learn something from them of not making so much waste. And the good thing is also with, with a lot of empty houses, um, beside the roads, you always find a place to pitch your tent. It's it's cool. Some even have a roof. Most of them don't have a roof anymore, but some do. And I really enjoy like being in the, in the tent at night or in the evening and sorting the pictures, writing the diary, and think what what have you seen during the day and write this all down and stuff. I like this kind of stuff. Further on towards the lake um, Titicaca. I went to see some a friend of this guy I stayed with in La Paz. He owned a fish farm. They were growing fish in, in big nets in Lake Titicaca. And I tell you, it was a lot of fish to produce those fish fingers. <laughs> it was interesting to see the whole process before I continued towards um, Peru. But Peru, you're only allowed to enter when the bike is registered on your name. And the problem was, my bike wasn't registered on me. So I had to go to the internet place, like an internet cafe, where they had the color printer, and register it on my name. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a problem, the police accepted the papers and stuff, and I was allowed in. This guy actually, he after all the border guys did my, my paperwork, he asked to see all the papers again. like two or three kilometers after the border. But I told him, I have to go to see, take photos of these um, Indians who live on the floating islands. I'm sorry, but I don't have time to do another passport control. And he accepted and I <laughs> <laughs> So I, I went to the fisherman's place where they were like small boats and, and asked some, some people, they were like looking, who is that stranger coming to our place? Usually people are afraid of that. And so I asked, someone and yes of course you can pitch your tent and stuff and and it turned out they had a boat so we went to see um, the Indians on their floating islands but not the normal touristic way but by hand on, on our own boat and just we could go much further than you can go with the touristic boats it was interesting so these are the islands we're talking about it's made out of um, shiv um, like grass or something and because it always rots away a little bit they have to put more every day like they they have to repair those islands to keep them floating they also made make these kind of boats and houses and everything out of this special grass which grows there instead of trees because you have to think Bolivia is, is almost all of Bolivia is more than 4,000 meters altitude there is no trees growing or something so they just use this kind of grass that's the way to Machu Picchu, the, the most known um, place in, in Peru. So of course I wanted to go there too. And I had a lot of rain during this trip and suddenly I found a traffic jam on a mud road. This is not very usual but when I went all the way to front I realized the rain and the, the rain had made the river so strong they just took away the whole bridge. And some truck drivers were already waiting three um, months. Oh. Uh, not months, uh, three days for, for the bridge to be rebuilt and I, it just took me one day or something and it was amazing these people they were not prepared to stay to spend a long time there but somebody ca had some chickens in the truck and somebody had some rice and somebody had a cooker and it started to be a big family and some everybody was, was doing something and everybody got some food and it was people started selling stuff it was like markets suddenly and cool, really cool. How, how did they repair the road? Um, we waited and then, then they, uh, they had a big um, just a bugger. It came to that place, they, they put some pipes in and put filled it with, with um, gravel 
and then they said passengers only were allowed to cross this this bridge but of course I'm a passenger with my bike so go um, yeah there were many many rivers we had to cross so um, you get used to it and only um, yeah as, as the I don't know his name before me told sometimes you have wet feet for for weeks but if you do trips like this you just can't go through without getting wet feet the only place I found to pitch my tent close to Machu Picchu or close to Santa Teresa was this place. It was already getting dark because I spent a lot of time at this bridge to wait. And it was a very steep road so there was no place to camp or something. And it was getting dark and then I suddenly saw this, this cross. And it lightened up the place and I saw it's perfect to pitch a tent. <laughs> Next day I, I went to to the um, train station of, of Santa Teresa where I left my bike and all my stuff with the guys at the entrance they allowed me to park it there and I start to walk to Aqua Caliente which is a little city on the on the feet of Machu Picchu there you can buy the ticket and then you go or you take the bus whatever you want it's it's about one one thousand meters altitude going up so it was very hard um, a hard walk but Finally, you reach it and you can take this picture, so you're very, you feel very happy. And and also, I, I was lucky because on these two hours I, I spent on Machu Picchu, the sun was shining. On the way to it, it was raining, and on the way back, it was raining as well. Later on, the rain stopped. Oh yeah, of course, Machu Picchu was crowded with people, and you see a lot of old people and and touristic people with with flip-flops and you've been you did hard work and you're really exhausted and then you see all these people with the flip-flops they they use the tr the um, train and then they use the bus <laughs> so you think oh you did all this hard work and <laughs> funny they didn't well do it for 4500 euros yes that's the other thing they pay a lot <laughs> i just paid 16 euros with my expired student card is there any, <laughs> is there any way to Stay there overnight? Yes, in Aqua Caliente there are many hostels and it's not too expensive actually. But in the, in the Machu yeah, there is a hotel, but it's something like $500 a night or something. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Wild camp, no, it's very steep. You, it's very hard to find a place. I would go down to Aqua Caliente. It's one kilometer up and one kilometer down. It's not too bad. You can spend the night in Aqua Caliente and go from Santa Teresa to Aqua Caliente. It's I think seven kilometers. Someone else told me ten kilometers, but it's it's um, not steep. It's it's straight. You can easily do it. I did the whole thing and back in one day, but you can easily do it three, two, three days. Yeah, I said the rain on the way back stopped, but just changed to snow. And I was still at about four thousand five hundred meters altitude, so it was freezing cold. But also here I found this little ho house, and I knocked if there would be someone on the door and stuff. There was nobody to open the door for me, so I had to do it myself and spent the night there. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, most of the road was white, but I just waited like two hours and then the first trucks go went past and they make the, the snow um, yeah, like this, so you can ride your bike. It was still very slippy, but you I was actually looking forward to the coast. You know, you're just two or three, four hundred kilometers away from the coast and at the coast it's it's desert it's gonna be warm and and you're freezing cold and wet and you just think i want to go to the desert which winds have you been there okay. sorry in which one again in which part of the year um it was winter time so i i started to buy the bike in november so this must have been february mm -hmm. something like february Yes, and finally, 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 just 80 kilometers before Nazca, the road started to go from 4,000 meters altitude down to sea level. It, w it got warm, I could change the, the settings of my carburetor because in the altitude you, you have to manipulate it a little bit because the bike needs more oxygen and it doesn't get enough oxygen, so you have to reduce the, the petrol, the amount of petrol. But when you go down, you have to change everything again and the tire pressure, you need more tire pressure suddenly and all this. But it was amazing because the landscape changed so much. As I said, I was in the desert. Some people lived in houses like this, they don't even have roofs. It is because they just had a big tsunami or something two years ago 
and it, it destroyed many villages. Earthquake. So these people... Earthquake? Yeah. Okay. So these people still live in houses like this. Very poor people, some of them. But yeah, it was warm. I enjoyed being there again. I went to a nice oasis called Wakashima. It's like 200 kilometers south of Lima, of the capital city. And it was like, yeah, I could make holiday from my holiday. You could walk up the dunes, of course. You could go um, sandboarding. You could take jeep tours. And of course you co could go swimming and there were, there were nice um, little hostels. There, were, there was Wi-Fi everywhere and of course there were places where you could also do wild camping. So really cool, really cool. Later on in Lima, I, I don't like big cities. I mean, it's very crowded. You can't be sure when you park your bike to go for a swim. You, if you come back, the bike might be gone or something. So I looked for a place to, to um, stay in Lima because I needed to change uh, the tires and to get some stuff. And I was allowed to pitch the tent at this church. So that was cool. And at this church, of course, you start to talk with people. Where do you, where do you come from? And, and they want to see your pictures. And then they say, oh yeah, but we have a house and come to us. We make a little campfire. <laughs> <laughs> and then further up um, north towards Ecuador, I followed the, the Pan American Highway and they all, you, you go through desert for a long time. The only thing you see is these big chicken farms and you actually smell them before you see them and they're full with, with chickens, I mean millions of them. Just in the hot desert there's nothing but these chicken farms. And yeah, sometimes they have oil pumps. And they also, <coughs> further um, north, close to Ecuador, they have nice beaches. You can really enjoy yourself there. <coughs> I got in contact with a little local fisherman. He proudly presented some, some fish to me when he saw me running around with the camera. And of course, you start talking and he invited me to pitch my tent close to his house. And it's always cool to, to see how people live and be invited with them. And, then they introduced you to the neighbors and, and he, he wanted to show me something. I didn't know what he wanted. And then he's, he got, we got a pen and a paper and he draw a, a picture and it turned out they, they were turkeys in the, in the sea. He wanted to show them to you. Amazing. I mean, they were this big or something. Yeah, on I went to Ecuador and it wasn't a problem to, to get the paperwork done and stuff. I saw Ecuador was green, was beautiful green. And there were many people. I mean, there's no no kilometer where there's either no people or no plantages. Plantages. They grow. They have big banana plantages. They are so big that they spray them from from airplanes to to put some dünger, some some chemicals on the bananas or something. They use airplanes. And when I asked myself why do they build their houses on 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 sticks, I found out just a few days later when the rain came back. <laughs> And it started to rain, I mean, this little bit of rain is a joke. It started to rain seriously and everything started to be flooded. That was the main road. And you had to follow it. And whenever a truck was overtaking you or a bus, you get a shower. <laughs> the capital city, Quito. So I crossed Ecuador quite fast and went towards Colombia. Also here, no problem to get the paperwork done. If you want some food just beside the roads, some guinea pigs, you should try. I didn't really enjoy them, they taste like rubber. I mean you chew and chew and chew and chew, but it wasn't really tasty. They're very famous church in Colombia, but I forgot the name. <laughs> some picture of a different church where I was allowed to stay before I continued. That's the Waldorf School. I don't know if somebody from you knows the Waldorf School. They have a Waldorf School in Colombia. And I was allowed to stay there as well. And they had a school garden and showed me. I mean, they grow bananas, oranges, nice fruits everywhere. There's, it's so nice and green in Colombia too. They have many nice flowers. 
and people run around with big knives and you get scared but they don't use the knives to kill you but just to offer you some nice fruits or something <laughs> Here on the restaurant, the lady was just preparing manjok. I told you about manjok yesterday. They just use them like potatoes. You can fry them, you can cook them. You, it, it's a plant you can make lots of things out of, but we hardly have it here. Because I was very scared of Venezuela, I got in contact with someone else on the internet and we decided to travel through Venezuela together. Um, you hear so many bad things about countries in the internet and from other people and stuff, but you hardly hear any good things. So I really try to tell you, Venezuela, it was, of course, it was hard to do the paperwork. We had to, um, go, we went to a border um, from Colombia to um, Venezuela, but unfortunately the guy had lost his stamp and he was looking to it for it in the drawers and stuff, but he couldn't find it. So we just had to go 50 kilometers more and try it on a different border. There he found the stamp. But then we had to go to a police station which was hidden somewhere and take the, the last road left and turn right and I don't know. It was very hard to find all these offices. They were not located at the border. But finally we were in the country and we liked it. People were friendly. And yeah, he, he had an accident and he, had a, he couldn't use his foot because he was standing on a traffic light and a car drove over his foot. And so that's why he, he just traveled this way. He changed gears with a little, um, with a little string on the on the gear. <laughs> yeah, this was entering Venezuela, and because I tried to go the same speed as the Carl R650, I went into the red um, RPM thing, and suddenly I felt my bike just going off while riding, and I checked it. I checked: is there um, electricity? The spark plug was working. I smelled, I put the engine in, tee -tee -tee, it was wet, so there was petrol, but there was no compression. So he told, we, we put a string to the um, foot, to the pedal, and he pulled me back to the next city, and there was a guy sitting in the sand with some tools around him and stuff, and he also knew, yes, if you go too fast with this bike, the valves usually bend. And because I knew um, Venezuela is going to be a very cheap country, petrol was cheap, usually it's one cent per liter or something but when you come with a bike um, j just to take seven liters they don't have change for that so they just say welcome to, to Venezuela and go and when they take out the pistol from your bike and to put it in the next car they don't even stop it I mean the petrol is going <laughs> <laughs> yes so that was Venezuela and, and therefore I didn't have didn't change a lot of money so I before you get someone working for you, you have to agree on a price. And I tried with hands and feet to make him understand, I just have US dollars. And he wrote in the sand, he wrote 200. And I thought, ah, oh, shit, man, 200, okay. If he can repair my bike and I continue the trip, I pay 200. And after a few hours, he, he went away and he came back and he had the, the valves and he just put them in very quickly. He knew what he's doing. It, it was amazing. I mean, with. In Germany, if you go to a dealer and you have some problems with the valves, they say come back two weeks later. Then they charge you a big amount and stuff. I, I mean, and here it was done within, let's say, the afternoon or something. And it turned out he actually wanted 200 of the local money, so it turned out to be 45 US dollars. We changed them, and, and I 45 US dollars included me sleeping in the in the garage of them. <laughs> yeah, they had nice waterfalls in Venezuela and beautiful landscape and the people were so friendly I don't know how people tell these bad stories about um, I don't know I mean I really enjoyed it and wherever you stop people had big knives and stuff but they offer you fruit nobody in Germany would, would offer a stranger some fruits or, or food if he stops but, but in Venezuela they're so friendly I was invited in many places and shown around, people had their own plantages or were growing vegetables and they wanted to see me and to take photos and I made many photos. I just took a few for this slideshow and he even owned a video camera and he always wanted me to stand at his house and at his places to, to take photos from me. 
They have huge trucks in Venezuela. I mean, in most of the countries in South America, actually. They have like two or three trailers. And be because I was going usually like 80, 90 kilometers an hour, but they go 120 or something, they want to overtake you. But they don't look. They You you're there and, and they come and they just start overtaking you. And when they see there's a, another car coming towards you, or towards them, because they're on the wrong lane, they just pull back on the right lane and they just push you off the road. <laughs> Luckily nothing seriously happened, just the the brake uh, pedal was, was bent and I, I went to the next little village and, and this guy had some tools and stuff and he, he uh, pushed it back and instead of, of presenting me a, a bill or some or asking for money, he just made some, some nice juice and, and came back with the juice. I mean, would this ever happen in Germany? <laughs> charge you to choose <laughs> <laughs> yeah. here they have a lot of old American cars they use a lot of petrol but for bikes it's usually free <laughs> and for a car to fill up a car like this it's like 50 cents or something <laughs> here I try to make some photos where I'm on as well and I also wanted to make some photos with this that's a, a nest of bees Wild bees, but it wasn't a really good idea. <laughs> Later on, I went. Yes, I went towards Brazil, and it was really beautiful landscape. I crossed the the rainforest for uh, for about two thousand kilometers, the Amazonian rainforest, and it was amazing to see um, plants growing on on trees and really amazing these big places later on someone told me um, on, on the map on the Brazilian map not on my map there is written something you're only allowed to stay on this road or in this part of the country till um, 6 o'clock p.m. because it's a uh, Indian territory and after 6 o'clock they're allowed to take everything from you I did wild camping there <laughs> nothing happened luckily <laughs> just enjoyed the the landscape, the, crossed the equator and went to Manaus. And in Manaus, I was on the traffic light and then someone started talking to me. Ah, where do you come from with the Chilean number plates? And we found out he was able to speak German as well. And he invited me, yeah, I have a house and come here and, and stay here. No, no, stay till tomorrow. I want to take you some, somewhere. And he took me somewhere and I suddenly ended up in a live TV show. <laughs> <laughs> And after this, um, the, the telephone rang and, and there was another TV, um, TV program wanting an interview of me, so I had to stay another day to go to them and stuff. It's, it's amazing. And then they put an article about me on the website of, of their um, TV station. And this made other people in Brazil writing emails to me, inviting me, if you ever come to this in this city, <laughs> just drop us an email. We are travelers as well. We saw you on TV. Visit, come to visit us. So I started to plan the, the <laughs> next um, st um, trip, parts of my trip, visiting all those people. It was great. First, from Manaus to Berlin, there's no road or no proper road going. So I had to take the ferry for about 2,000 kilometers, five days. Which one? First or the second? <laughs> first, first trip or second trip? Have you seen the Aida? Ah, the Aida. <laughs> <laughs> no, I took the cheaper one. <laughs> And it was cool, I mean, people tell you that you, you're going to be but robbed on the ferry, that they cheat you while, while buying the tickets and stuff. Of course, you go to, to different places, you ask for the ticket price, and, and when you get an idea how much it is about, you start negotiating and stuff, and you press them down, and I don't know, I paid $150 for the, for the trip, five days on the ferry. It's not too bad. Usually people stay on, sleep in those hammocks, it's cool, it's, it's very comfortable during the night, but sometimes I wanted to have a little bit more privacy, so I just pitched my tent. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to have a tent which is able to stand without hooks, and it protects you from, from mosquitoes and stuff. The ferry went along this river through the beautiful Amazonian rainforest, and you could really enjoy the landscape. It was so beautiful, you could see people living there. 
I mean, there is no electricity, there is no running water, there is not even roads, but people live there. And on, on, on one day, I saw those kids um, waiting for the ferry, then they threw a hook and, and pulled themselves to the ferry. The ferry was going 25 kilometers an hour, and, and they, they entered it. And first I thought they, they're making a joke or something. And yeah, they came closer, they, they entered the ferry and to sell fruits. I mean, they were working, it was hard work for them. They, they, they brought nice fruits and, and later on they, they went off and waited for, the, for another ferry to go back. <laughs> and you can see when you slowly pass, go through this, this beautiful landscape, people live there. They have little houses. They have, there's no road, there's nothing, but they live there. And I would have loved to stay and spend some days or, or something there, but the ferry unfortunately was going on. It's, I mean, it's just nature, it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah, there was this um, sweetwater dolphin, it's not a dolphin. Someone told me how the name of it, I Buro or something. It's not a dolphin. And here you see the contrast. It's Belém, the civilization on the right, and the rainforest on the left. And in Belém, they had a market which is open 24 hours a day. So there was always some, some things going on. And sometimes you have to wake up, if you want to buy something, you have to wake up the people selling. Um, on the ferry, of course, I was the only traveler because it wasn't the, the, the tropical touristy season. So you get in contact with many people and of course people took me to their place and said yeah but if you go to Belém it's dangerous you can't go there come to our house stay there and in Brazil people live together with their family they have their grandchildren they have their aunts daughters cousins it's it's huge and from from 20 30 people one more or less doesn't matter <laughs> also a cool thing in Brazil there is not so many strict rules like we have. So you can buy copies of CDs, films, even windows, just on the market. <laughs> in the north of Brazil, people live in houses like this. It reminded me of Africa. People didn't have electricity, no running water. But they were happy and they were so friendly, it's amazing. And if not people welcomed me, it was their dogs running bah, 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 when they hear me coming. And it's a perfect place to do wild camping, of course. You see some nice birds and then it turned out to be a pet. And people show you around and then introduce you to the neighbors. I really enjoyed it. This lady, she had to walk for a kilometer or something to get fresh water. But it was cool. And a, a really, really beautiful area, the north of Brazil. Here, Manjok again, he just to, to prepare supper he just went behind his house pulled up out one of his of these plants then they prepare it and yeah you cook it and that's what they have for 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 yeah for supper no electricity no Ceran Kochfeld no um, cooking station <laughs> really cool <clears throat> yeah then I continued my trip south <coughs> went towards um, Teresina visited people in Uberlandia and went to Barretos. Barretos, it was the biggest motorbike travel, oh, motorbike meeting in Brazil. 40,000 people, so a little bit more than here. <laughs> and of course you come with the Chilean number plate, you get the trophy for the guy who came the, the furthest distance. And they had really cool shows, I mean, amazing. I can still learn something from him. <laughs> Tomorrow, eh? Yeah, you show me how to do that? Yeah, on your bike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then I went down, uh, crossed um, Sao Paulo and went towards Rio. Of course, you have to visit Rio and of course there was somebody who invited me to go to Rio. I was very happy about this because usually in big cities it's very hard to find a place to stay. And Rio was beautiful. I mean, have you ever seen a city like this? It's Sao Paulo is flat. I didn't really like Sao Paulo. They had huge traffic jams and, and highways with 20 lanes, but all traffic jam and crowded and still people with motorbikes went pa um, 
far beside those or between those cars who were stuck in the traffic jam very quickly and I was just going slowly and then they start hooting behind me so I don't know but I enjoyed Rio and of course these yeah th those people had invited me to stay and you could go to the famous Copacabana beach drink drink some nice juice out of the coconut and have fresh have fresh fish and stuff they also showed me people who were selling tomatoes beside the road well selling tomatoes on the right you see a tomato, but on the left it's... Ah, I forgot the name again, but it's really sweet. It's it's not a tomato, it's a but it's a very sweet... Um, Dio Spiro. Dio Spiro? Dio Spiro. Aha, uh -huh, okay, I thought it sounded different. In, in Portuguese it's Dio Spiro. Okay, it was amazing because I thought they were selling tomatoes, but no, it's, it's delicious sweet fruit. They also had exotic birds around there and... I mean, it's green and it feels like like real being in the nature, even if you're in a big city. And those people were um, fan, they, they like to go diving. And of course, when they ask you, do you like to try? Of course I won. So they they gave me all this equipment and stuff and told me, don't move, just ta sell this. That means it's okay. So don't think me, get me wrong. And um, he, he just took me, grabbed on, on and, and showed me around like he knows what he's doing. It was amazing, we went down to 30 meters or something. And then he said, yeah, but, but some people want to um, want to talk to you, some of my friends and stuff, it was TV again. I mean, they were really crazy. Yeah, then afterwards Honda also invited me, yes, we want to see you, we want... They, they changed the oil, they changed the chain, they did a lot of stuff and, and didn't want any money for it. So amazing. And I also, they have yeah, newspaper and stuff, you just, you, I mean, I don't understand what they write, but people said it was positive, it wasn't too <laughs> Be aware. Yes. Yeah, that, that was the trip. Great. Any questions? How many months was the trip? Nine months. Nine months. Twenty-eight thousand. Did you sell the bike then? Yes. In, in Brazil? I, I went to the. I went out of Brazil and sold it on the border to Paraguay. Did it help a lot to travel on a small bike? Yes, I money? think. Yeah, not only to save money, but also um, you don't look too fancy, too touristy, and when you come to border controls in Peru or something, um, they don't. The police don't realize you're a tourist. And when they realize you already passed them and can just wave back. But if you come with these, I mean, you, sometimes you see tourists, you see, you think there's another sun um, going up the horizon <laughs> when they have big lights and usually they have lots of luggage so the light is going much too high. And you can see them a long way and, and you see they have money so of course the police tries to get them. But with the small bike it was cool and it was also, it helped to get in contact with the local people because they, they all have these kind of bikes. And they think, oh, you can go so far with it, and and, and they they're really amazed, and, and that makes you have have like you have the same hobby with them. You're not above them. You you're the same, and that's that's really cool. And also, if you have a breakdown, all the the tool the parts are available. You get tires for fifteen dollars or something. Um, yeah, that's there. And I also I I can go ninety kilometers an hour with my Transalp in Africa. I, I usually didn't go faster, so no need to get to take a bigger bike. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You get new or used? Um, I bought it used for 800 euros, but you can get it new for 1000. Would you sell it for? Sorry? Would you sell it? I sold it for 300. <laughs> How much kilometer could you drive with uh, one? Uh, well, I bought it with 10,000. I don't. I did 28,000, or it was 38. No, I no. How, how much kilometer with one no, fuel no. tank? Uh, one fuel tank is about 200. Okay. But I had some um, for sometimes on some parts of the road. When I knew um, the, the petrol, the, there is no um, petrol station, I just took some old um, oil cans or some, some, some old canisters and with, with four or five liters and just screwed them on the back. And when I knew I didn't, I don't need them anymore, I just throw them away. You can get old canisters everywhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.